All right. Well, we're, uh, in fact, going to move immediately to our next, our last keynote uh, of the day. Uh, I think a person that many of you may know puts a perfect uh, perfect bow on the day that uh, we heard everything from uh, the requirements to the challenges, uh, the difference of perspectives. And at the Department of Defense, we brought the right person here to talk about how the Department of Defense is approaching this. Uh, we're going to next move and listen to Ms. Estee Miller, the Principal Deputy, Department of Defense Chief Information Officer. She has to make the, the intro short. So let me just simply say she has worked in the Air Force, the Army, and DOD across uh, the department. And I would say she spent a career participating, building, and leading the workforce we're discussing here. Let's listen now to Ms. Estee Miller and her perspectives. Thank you very much. So if you guys don't mind, I'm going to play on the floor. It's the end of day, and I know I'm the only thing between you and your beverage of choice, whatever that may be. It's rare. Well, first, let me thank the FCA leadership team for inviting me out. Somebody asked earlier if our workforce person, if I was here to replace our workforce person. And I said, yeah, yeah. I'm here because of the Shea Wood Warwick team saying, be here. Uh, but I've been a member of AFCIA since I started my career 30 <clears throat> years ago. And having grown up in federal space, I can say the organization has invested much in me, and I've reaped the reward, reward and benefit from AFCIA as well. Mike, you're killing me, man. Um, it's very rare I get out of the building for a speaking engagement and I get to spend the entire day. So this is the first time in a long time. Don't tell the folks back in the building, no phone calls, no meetings, just unplug, sit in the back and listen to what's going on. And everything, everything that we've been talking about, not just across DOD, but across federal government, has been talked about today. So if this is the first time for some of you, you got a really good deal. So I want to chat just a little bit about what we're doing at the OSD level for workforce across government. But I can't go home without talking a little bit about the digital modernization strategy. Have you guys all seen that? I don't know if that's good or bad. Ryan, that should be at least one hand. Um, <laughs> So every year we publish the National Defense Strategy. Secretary of Defense is responsible for that. Last year we published the first digital modernization strategy that the department has had. And it was an opportunity for us to clearly lay out what we're going to focus on over the next few years and where it's shut. The services are collaborating much better. Um, because the strategy lays out where our investment priorities are, and it helps shape those budgets so that we can certify where the money is being spent at the end of the year. But what's the good thing about that? We know where the operational capabilities are. We know where the operational gaps and shortfalls are, and we can plan and program accordingly. But the strategy focuses on four areas, cyber, C3, cloud adoption, and artificial intelligence. If you read the strategy, you get a very, very clear picture on what we're looking to do in those four areas. But the one thing that underpins all of it is how we develop our cyber workforce. It's pertinent and relevant to each and every one of those areas. Put that aside. summer last year, there was a team of folks in from the University of Virginia. For the second year, they won the National Cyber Defense Challenge. They come into the building and spend time with the CIO leadership team. It is about 10 college students, sophomore, junior, seniors, and we're having an absolutely wonderful conversation about the challenge and the things they, that they had to do to win. We soon realized the predominant of that team were not cyber IT 
are technically related students. Some of them just so happened to be walking past a message board and saw that there was a cyber team being put together and thought they would be interested and, and join. Pretty cool deal to me. So then my question becomes, how many of you know that those same skill sets and experiences that you got going through the challenge are what we need in the department? None. How many of you have considered employment with the De Department of Defense? None. And did I mention there was only one female on the team? And she just happened to be the team captain. So girl power. <laughs> but it, it was a great opportunity for us to change the dynamic of what they considered doing next. But it also forced me to go back and talk to the workforce team to have a real candid conversation that I've tried to have across the services as well about how we change the conversation. To get at all of the challenges that we've talked about today, we as a collective have to change the conversation. The who, the what, and the how. You know, we have these conversations that are centered around bits and bytes, around technologies, not around problem solving or critical thinking skills and how all of that comes together to impact the mission that we have to protect and defend the nation. We don't have the conversations about what our kids need to do to step in a space that they consider untouchable. How do we break that barrier? We don't have the conversation on the hiring processes. You talk to someone about coming to work for the government and they think USA jobs, they think six, eight months, they think security clearance, they think it'll be a while before they're on net. And in some cases, Ron would say it is a while before they're on the net. But we don't talk about Congress giving us authorities in the cyber accepted service to give us flexibility for hiring and flexibility for compensation pay. We don't talk about the opportunity for them to come in as interns. Oh, by the way, I started two weeks out of college. To let us invest in them, and then we make the decision whether or not it's a good fit. I had a meeting with Alan Paller and some folks earlier today, and one of the organizations mentioned, hey, I'm, I'm good at bringing them in because I've got direct hire authority. What I don't have is the ability to let them go when I realize they're not a good fit. That's the conversation we're not having. Because you've got that age old adage once you come into federal service, it takes a whole lot for us to get rid of you. Well, we've got some flexibilities that we need to make sure the workforce, particularly the hiring supervisors, know how to deal with that. We were with Secretary of Defense and the leadership team a few weeks ago, particularly personnel and readiness, talking about how we were doing just in numbers across the board and the length of time it takes us to hire people. I won't tell you how long, but it's much, much longer than 90 days. Now, he has pushed us now to start a pilot to see how many new hires we can do within a period of 90 days across several career fields. So what did we get from a couple of the career field managers? I can't do that, I don't have a need, and I'm doing okay using USA Jobs. We know that's not the case. So now our cloud and AI team are both looking at commercial recruiting companies to help parallel our efforts to bring people in because Oh, by the way, bringing them in is a whole lot different than bringing in somebody who's ready to go. Because just because I have a certificate and just because I have training in education doesn't mean I can actually have the ability or capability to do something on the net. How do we close that gap? 
So while we may know what knowledge, skills, and abilities we're looking for, how do we make sure that conveys an actual doing something? So those are the challenges that we're looking at across the, not only the department, but federal government. We're partnering with the federal CIO, which has CIOs from across government for federal reskilling program. And Alan Power and team were very key to that. First cohort was of people with absolutely no technical expertise whatsoever. A quarter of those were from Department of Defense. We graduated that class about two or three months ago, and hearing some of the testimonials, um, I felt like I was in church and had been converted. To hear a budget analyst or an acquisition person say, hey, I have an interest in the cyber landscape, but I really did not understand the importance of IA training, or I really didn't understand what a network person does, didn't understand what a firewall was, but now I'm ready to go and re -com or compete for a job in the career field. Or I'm ready to go back to that program that I was managing and tell them, you know what, all of that security stuff that they're doing, that they tell us to do, really is important. It's not just something they make us do. So there was an increased level of awareness on one hand, and on the other, it was a great recruiting mechanism for folks who were sitting in occupational series that needed to be reskilled. So we're now in the midst of the second cohort, and there are people that are within the IT cyber career field. To give them exposure, particularly to some of the certifications and things that the SANS Institute does, and some of the operational challenges that we have in front of us that, you know what, they need to be able to work through. Because your typical 2210 or IT specialist doesn't necessarily have exposure to what we do on the offensive side, or in some cases, what we do on the defensive side. Two big things. I mentioned the Cyber Accepted Service, CITEP. Have you guys heard of that? The Cyber Information Technology Exchange Program. The previous panel talked about, you know, we never, we can't compete with industry, and it's not the intent. I tell the team, we need to look at how we make this complementary. CITEP helps us do that, where we're rotating government folks into industry organizations and industry into government for six months to a year. The military services, assuming they have the dollars, have the permission and the authority to go do that. That will be, I think, a key way of making sure, not just from a recruiting aspect, but a cross flow of experience and expertise. So let's go back to the who, what, and how. I feel very strongly that we are recruiting we're missing out an opportunity with regard to recruiting. We're leaving opportunities on the table by not going to some of our underserved communities. General Crawford and I met with a series of HBCU presidents last year, and we'll do it again this year. Most small liberal arts schools that were interested in determining how they get their students recruited into government our natural inclination is to focus on the major universities that have technical programs in the areas where we're focused on. Hey guys, there's a whole nother population out there with students getting the soft skills, critical thinking skills, or somebody like me. I came out and the Air Force hired me as a computer programmer. 30 <clears throat> years later, and I can say, you know what, I've had a pretty darn good career. But who's having those discussions in those smaller areas? We've got to get out of the big cities, go into the rural areas, and make sure we are exposing not just the opportunities, but the mission set. Because I suspect we've got plenty of kids who are willing to serve and are looking to do something to make a difference. Those are the things that we are focused on from the departmental level to shift the mindset and the focus a little bit. 
we commissioned the Workforce Committee under the federal CIO to go take a holistic look on what do we need to do from recruiting to retaining, and we added another one in there called measurement. Because if we don't start capturing metrics on what we're doing with the workforce, we will have no idea how well we're doing. We will have no idea where our investment is going as we're training and developing people who may or may not stay with us. What do we do from here? I would say everybody in this room has a responsibility in this space to mentor, to invest, and to bring along that next generation. The second conversation I had with Alan Paller was where is the next Ron Pontius? Where is the next Essie Miller? Where is the next Ed Cardone? If we don't get our hands around establishing a better process to mature that pipeline, the person that steps in the roles behind us will have a huge challenge ahead of them. I don't know about you, but my timeline is getting a little short. <laughs> it should be really easy for us to identify a slate of candidates to step in behind us. It's turning out to be a conversation that is a little late to need. But each of us can contribute to that. Whether you're industry, academia, or government, you have an opportunity to help us reshape this conversation. Now, all of that said, my speech went out the window because of everything that I heard throughout the day. This was really worth being out of the building. But I want a conversation with you guys. Tell me what you think. Tell me what opportunities we're missing. And tell me what we can do together. Questions? Thank you. I didn't mean for that to be a sermon, but that's where my heart took me. Ma'am, I've got the questions that came in back here. Okay. I've got one. Um, specifically, they were asking about the direct hire process and where are those jobs or needs um, posted or, or for more information on that. Barry and I left that website upstairs. Um, a predominant of them are going through USA Jobs. As I mentioned earlier, we are using some recruiting companies for, particularly for cloud and AI. Ooh. Can I send you guys the website? I'll take that as a task. The challenge we're having, a little bit concerned there, is with the supervisors really stepping into direct hire. Because I think, Ron, you guys are doing pretty good at some of the recruiting fairs where we're making on-the-spot offers. We took a great deal of time a year or so ago to identify the skills required for every cyber IT position in the department gave us a great inventory to start with. We have to focus on keeping that current. So I owe you guys that website. Last two years, we hired 1,500 people with direct hire. Last two years. And as I left the building yesterday, we're at about 5,200 more vacancies across the department. Ma'am, second question. How do you reconcile the desire to throw a wider net with federal government being prescriptive in degrees and years experience? We're challenging that as well. Contrary to popular belief, IT, cyber, is not a positive degree occupational series for OPM. It's the... Oh, I thought I had a stalker. It's the... Again, back to shifting the culture to understand it doesn't, I'm going to say this, but I think you guys know what I mean. I don't have to have a degreed individual for every position. It's understanding the requirements of that. Cyber Accepted Service helps us with assessing those qualifications as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. But cyber is an area where clearances are absolutely mandatory requirements. 
But guess who just took on that process? DOD. DOD, exactly. So as we're working with the folks in the intel community, we've asked them to help us get through that. And I referred to a meeting with the secretary not too long ago. He reiterated that challenge. There's got to be some innovative ways. Even if I do, I do a NACI just to get a CAC. If I do an initial assessment, pretty quick to tell if somebody's going to fall through the wayside or not. So we're hoping the intel community can help us push that through. Next question. As the service is making progress, are there any pitfalls that DOD is monitoring or has concerns about? I mentioned earlier, right now we have no way of watching and maintaining or tracking the workforce. I may invest in Jennifer Knapper coming in into a specific critical job given her the training and education, but I have no concerted way of tracking where she goes throughout the rest of her career. Because ideally, if I could do that, when I have an opportunity to pop up in a different organization, I know the folks I can reach out to for that. So we've got to figure out how to close that gap. Sandra. Sandra. From a security aspect? No, as a CAC. You know, I'm skilled. My blockchain can start back where they start, what they do, how they certify and qualify, and then can we have a better way of knowing what they're capable of doing and where they should go with that capability? We have not had that conversation. We should. Okay. There's a website. All right, my task is done. Oh, should I read it out loud? <laughs> Anything else? What else is on your mind? Ma'am, I've got a few more questions. It has been mentioned throughout the day that degrees and certifications don't necessarily mean a person can do the job. How did the DOD measure and or change that fact? That's exactly what I alluded to earlier. We're hiring folks based on the credentials that they have or that they attest to. We get them in, and they're not ready to go. So we've got to figure out how we do that within the confines of, one, OPM requirements and cyber accepted service. My, my challenge to the team is we should be able to let folks go as soon as, as quickly as we hire them if they cannot meet the need. But we've got to be really, really clear in what we're hiring for. Now, I may get in trouble for that one, but that's where we're pushing. How would you recommend we incentivize cyber learning and cyber workforce as a nation? Everything that we've talked to through today in terms of awareness, in terms of education, we, again, we've got to change the conversation that we're having to make sure the broader population understands not just the mission of DOD, but the challenge that we have in protecting the information of every citizen of this country. And I think somebody said it on the last panel. Everybody is a part of the cyber workforce, to agree. Everybody has a responsibility, but we've got to have those conversations. Every month is Cyber Awareness Month. This is more than a 30-day deal, okay, 31 days. And, and we've just got to focus on growing that. Ms. Miller, thank you very much. That was our final question. Please welcome back to the stage General Wood to formally thank Ms. Miller on behalf of ASEA and our audience. I do. I do. Uh, as, as ever, I always learn when I listen to Ms. Miller speak and uh, describe not only the challenges but the solutions they're working on. It's hard to get ahead of her. Uh, but she took a do out and delivered already. Cyber work, all one word, cyber work dot defense dot gov. Cyber work, all one word, dot defense dot gov, and we'll post it tomorrow morning as well. Thank you. You bet. Um, and I think, uh, the hiring fair is happening at the reception, right, Ms. Miller? Right. Okay. All right. Fine. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, we are, we are pretty close to terminal. Terminal burnout here. We are, in fact, done. Uh, we're going to have a, an event that uh, starts up tomorrow about 8 o'clock in the morning. 
We're moving to a reception. Thank you very much to Foxhole Technology for sponsoring the reception. Don't forget the students out there. They put a lot of work into the posters and the representations. We've got first uh, Fort Valley State University, Spelman College, and a number of other universities from Augusta University as well who will be presenting. Uh, tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, as I mentioned, General Yee will lead a panel. If you've not had the opportunity to hear a panel led by General Yee and, frankly, uh, uh, Mr. Pontius as well, please be here. It'll be great. I, I just guarantee, by the way, it's a, a great set of speakers with a heck of a lot of experience. See the program for details. Look, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Take care.